some thoughts that I have and some, uh, things that I found find of interest. And in this particular case, uh, it's a God that never changes. Is this on record? Okay, just gotta make sure. Um, thank you for uh, the songs and the uh, scripture and the children's story and uh, thank you for Sabbath school this morning. Uh, I, I didn't realize how close part of my sermon goes with the Sabbath school lesson, but it does. And uh, maybe that's a good thing. Um, but uh, before I get started, uh, let's have a added word of prayer. Father God, we ask you to be here this uh, morning. Let your Holy Spirit guide uh, as I give your word, Lord, and we pray that um, I can uh, rise some questions and uh, or raise some questions, and uh, we pray that you will bless this morning and bless each one that hears this message. In Jesus' name, amen. A God that never changes is probably nothing that you haven't heard before, right? I, I'm sure that you've heard uh, a lot, most of things today. So, um, but that's the idea that I want to present today. If you don't walk away with anything else today, know that our God does not change. He is the same throughout time. And uh, we can put our faith in him. I read a story about a man flying his plane from one place to another. And he found himself flying into a storm. And as he checked his instruments, he saw that he was low on gas and it was closer to go where he was going to turn around and go back. So he continued to go through the storm. The storm got worse as he traveled, and he got to the point where he couldn't see which direction he was going. He couldn't tell his up from his down. I don't know. Gravity should have told him, but I haven't been in that position, but I've heard that it happened, so I have to believe at that. You get there, and you don't know. Maybe it's because you're being tossed around so much by the wind. After a while, he began to question his instruments, thinking that they had malfunctioned. He began to fly by the seat of his pants, right, so to speak. A local farmer out uh, by his barn could hear a plane close by, and it seemed to be flying very low. And then there was an explosion as the pilot crashed in a nearby field. What caused this tragedy? The pilot had a set of instruments to guide him to safety. He had the training and the knowledge. Like so many other people in the world, he decided to fly by the seat of his pants. He trusted only in himself to trust his own feelings and his own conclusions. We live in a time that we hear there are no absolutes, that everyone must decide for themselves what is right for them. I'm going to decide what is best for me. It's my life, it's my body, it's my time, and I'm old enough to decide what I want. I make my own rules and I live my life the way I want to. Nobody's heard this stuff, right? It seems like everybody wants to live as they see fit. The fact is that God has a set of rules for us to live by. And man is and has been 
absolutely, absolutely aware of them. I hope my thoughts today are clear for you. Think about how God would want to start the Bible to get people to listen. How would you start a love letter, a love letter so someone to somebody that you loved? How would you start that letter? Would it be thou shalt not? That doesn't sound very loving, does it? Even though it is in its uh, place and time, but not at all. Moses was led by the Holy Spirit, and the Bible starts out showing God's love for us. He says, I created this world for you. He says, I created all this vegetation, all this food, all the animals to help you, and the companion to share in the responsibilities. I gave you purpose in caring for all I have created. Out of my love for you, and I'm going, I'm, I'm not only going to uh, love you, but I'm going to set aside one day in seven so that I can spend that time with you and we can enjoy each other. We are shown three of God's absolutes, his characteristics. One, that he is all powerful and all knowing because he has the power to create and maintain everything while knowing the end from the beginning. We also begin to see God's love in this story. It's a love story, not a dictatorship. God set, up a set about uh, presenting things in the proper order. So we have a clear picture of who he is and what went wrong. That's a major part of the story. And it also shows God's love. Love is one of those absolute uh, absolutes about God that will never change. And we see that throughout the entire Bible. God's love never changes. God does not change. What changes is man. Mankind is what we see changing. Adam and Eve sinned against God. Adam and Eve decided they knew what was best for themselves instead of trusting in God. Out of his love, we see two more of his absolutes. His mercy and his grace. He didn't destroy man for their sin. They fell under grace. And he gave the promise to mankind of a redeemer. Based on knowing the end from the beginning and preserving mankind, there was a limit to the amount of wickedness that God allowed. We see in Genesis 6, 5, where it says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So God prepared a remnant people and destroyed the earth by a flood. God didn't change, right? Man did. Man decided they would do what they wanted and ignored God. Again, sound familiar? We continue to fall into the same trap over and over again. Nothing new under the sun, if I may. Again, the idea that 
I'll do what I want because I know what's best for my life. Shows up time and time again. God continued to show man his love. It doesn't take long for humanity to forget and fall away, as we see at the Tower of Babel and the 40 years in the desert. Even with God leading, leading and clothing and feeding them the whole way through the desert for 40 years. In the first five books of the Bible, we are shown things in the order that God saw fit for Moses to represent him to his creation. I've heard so many times that God didn't tell man or give man his law, which is another one of God's attributes, his law. Until And this didn't happen. He didn't give that until Mount Sinai. It seems ridiculous and not at all like his character, if you think about it. My understanding comes from Amos 3.7, where it says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants and his prophets. As our scripture, which Lindsay read for us, says, The Lord, or I the Lord, do not change. He's saying, I don't change. I'm the same. You can depend on that. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So as far back as you want to go back, as far forward as you want to go, he's going to be the same. Let's stop and think about a loving, merciful God and question one idea here. Knowing God's absolute characteristics, would he destroy thousands upon thousands of people for something they were not aware of at the time? In any way, they didn't, they didn't know. But does that sound like a loving God to me, to, to you? I mean, I, I, I have a hard time with that just because it wasn't written down until Mount Sinai doesn't mean they weren't aware. Could the antediluvians, that's pre-flood people, have had verbal communications that weren't presented in scriptures? Did they even need things written down? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thought that makes a lot of sense. I say this because they lived long lives, and they had angels guarding the gates of the Garden of Eden right up until the flood. So I can't help wondering, did they communicate with these angels? I know they would probably be af afraid of a flaming sword, but would they have communicated? I understand that things weren't written down. But Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was no written law at the time to show that God expected animal sacrifice from Cain and Abel. But God said clearly, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? They had to know. It doesn't tell us. That doesn't mean it wasn't said, wasn't explained. I have to think and believe they knew. How did he know what was right? We aren't told. There was no law about sacrifice, so was Cain wrong? Yes, he was wrong. Absolutely, he was wrong. But that's based on the understanding of the whole story. We have the whole story. Well, we don't know what we're going to have. It says no man knows a future, right? So, But we have the whole story of the past so far, most of it, at least here on earth. Obviously, there are things communicated that we aren't told about. Think about this. 
did God request later a tenth of everything, including produce? So why was it wrong if his, he wasn't told in advance? Or was he? First of all, there's a difference. We're talking about a sin offering and not a tithe offering. And the story offers the idea that they were told. Could it be uh, could it make sense that Moses was writing almost 2,000 years later that there was no need to state everything that he was about to explain later anyway? And in his explaining, it would flow more gracefully. Truthfully, there is very little information about before the flood and leading up to Abraham. About 13,000 years until the flood. As I said, it's a love letter. So the falling away and the punishment part needed to follow later along with thou shalt not. There was no written law stating that murder was a sin. But God punished Cain. We believe Job lived just before Abraham. So it would have happened long before Mount Sinai. And Job is recorded as understanding God's moral law by what Moses wrote in Job. This supports the idea of what God said in Genesis 25, 4 through 5. I will make my descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions or laws, as you read in the King James Version. It is never spelled out what God is referring to. We're talking 500 years before Mount Sinai and before God spoke his Ten Commandments and wrote them in stone. What about animal sacrifice for atonement of sin that God instituted while preparing animal skins for Adam and Eve, the first death? the first recorded death in the Bible. You have Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, the high priest Melchizedek, and Moses as examples of people making sacrifices before God's instructions at Mount Sinai. What I'm trying to show is not only is our creator God unchangeable, but the Ten Commandments are part of God's character and therefore unchangeable as God himself. The unchangeable aspect of God is called immutability. God and his character never changes. Since the Ten Commandments represent God's character they are inseparable and immutable. Wouldn't it be God? Uh, wouldn't it be bad if God's law of gravity were reversed or stopped working? We would fly into space, as well as the Earth flying away from the sun. Would be dead pretty much instantly. Maybe a minute or two get out of the atmosphere. Here. Not a good way to go. God's other laws are just as unchangeable. We have a hard time with immutability because we as mankind, nature, uh, politics, prices, disease, temperatures, and so many other things change so rapidly we can't keep up. We change all the time. We get old, we turn gray, 
we get strong, we get weak, we get sick, and we get well. All our aspects change. We have a ch uh, to change from who we were when we were born or will we will be lost because we are born in need of a savior. So we have to change. As we change and become more like Christ, we are changed spiritually and we are changed from sinners to saints. And we're justified in Christ. Over time, we experience change, the change of sanctification and to glorification only when our Lord returns. And I hope we're all looking forward to that time. Going back to the problem that people look at how they should live based on their own feelings, it says in Judges uh, uh, 17 6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. It's the same back then as it is now. In this story in Judges, we see a man named Micah, whose mother had a silver, silver idol made by a silversmith to put in her son's house. He had a shrine in his house and made an ephod and had other idols, first appointing his son as a priest. He later hired a young Levite to act as his father and priest, offering him both room and board along with 10 shekels of silver per year. The father part is just a respect thing like Father Abraham. The young Levite couldn't turn down the generous offer. Uh, <clears throat> the part to notice is they did as they saw fit. And it was against God's spoken and written word at the time. Thou shalt have no other idols. Thou shalt have no other gods. It was against God's word for anybody to be a priest except for a Levite. There are many things wrong with that story, but they did as they saw fit. This is a reoccurring theme throughout the Bible and history. Man doing what they see fit in their own eyes. Today we hear, if, if it feels good, do it. Or just do it. I bought a Nike t-shirt, says just do it. My wife said, is that the message you want to give? Oh, I love that blue shirt. Anyhow, I don't, I haven't been wearing it. Uh, the just do it attitude is where sin is given license in man's life. If we aren't careful. God is accused of change because the Bible says, it repenteth the Lord, or it grieved the Lord, or God was sorry he had created man. The word in question speaks of God's grief over man's sin. It doesn't mean that God changed his mind or that God thought he had somehow made a mistake in creating man. It means that God's heart was broken or grieved or made sad over the sin that had covered the earth. So no, God did not change. He is immutable. He does not change. God is a provider. He is faithful. God's prophecies and plans never change because he knows the end from the beginning. He has no need to change. He knows what's going to happen so he can state it as it is. He keeps his promises and does whatever he says he will do. God's greatest evidence can be seen in the life, death, resurrection, and heavenly ministry for mankind in his only begotten son. The fact that he gave his only begotten son for you and I 
as well as Jesus Christ's own self-sacrifice says it all. We shouldn't need any more evidence than that showing of love. 1 Peter 1, 20 through 21 says he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through you or through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. We know beyond a doubt God can be trusted. We are reassured in life eternal and in the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprighteousness. It says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Heaven, uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, says the Lord. In 2 Peter 2, 20 through 21, it says, to the law and the testimony, if you do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by prophets' own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human spoke from uh, God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We can trust his holy word. We can trust in him. We can trust in his son, Jesus. God is holy. God is loving. God is merciful. God is good. God is wise. God is just. And God is faithful. God has many immutable, unchangeable attributes, all leading to our ability to trust in him wholly and completely. We live in a time when we cannot allow our faith to be shaken and we cannot allow ourselves to push aside God's absolutes because we are going to be judged by those absolutes. If we cannot, cannot let me start that over. If we don't want to crash and burn, we won't fly by the seat of our pants. We need to hold on to the word of God because it is the key to our salvation in Jesus Christ. We are the ones that need the change, not God. Will you pray with me? Father God, uh, we open our hearts to you. We open our hearts to your change. We open ourselves, our hearts, and our minds, Lord, so that you can lead us, so that you can guide us, so that you can be our God. We look forward to that day that you come back for us. And we praise you for the love that you have for us, even though we do not deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.